Welcome, Mutson Valley, to this week's edition of In Touch, the public affairs and issues program that runs across Town Square Media, the Hudson Valley radio stations. This week's guest is Doreen Harris, president and CEO of the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, NYSERDA for short. Doreen and I talk about the Climate Act, Governor Hochul's recent State of the State address, and important green energy issues in the Hudson Valley. Doreen offers a number of tips for residents to cut down on energy costs and reduce their carbon footprint. We invite you to join us and listen to a previously recorded conversation between Doreen and myself here on In Touch. Hello, Hudson Valley. You're listening to another episode of In Touch, Town Square Media, the Hudson Valley's public affairs and issues program. We got a great episode lined up for you today. With us, we have Doreen Harris, president and CEO of NYSERDA. Doreen, how are you? I'm great. Uh, thanks for having me, Connor. And it's probably better that we're doing this, you know, over the computer today, considering the weather that <laughs> we're having. We got the snow, so uh, good thing that we're staying safe, playing it safe and everything. But um, this is a really exciting time for New York and for NYSERDA and everything going on. Um, Governor Kathy Hochul just had the State of the State address, which will address in a moment. And there's a lot of great, exciting things, uh, environmentally speaking, for New York. But before we get into that, for those who are unaware of NYSERDA, could you just give like a quick uh, summary on what exactly NYSERDA is for our listeners? Of course. Yes. So NYSERDA stands for the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, uh, but NYSERDA works just fine. And uh, the the key aspect of our work is to advance clean energy on behalf of the state. So, so that's really what our mission is here to do, is to not only advance clean energy projects, but also the economy, the jobs, and the emissions reductions that, that come with them. So we uh, certainly have uh, been in place uh, as an institution of the state for decades, actually, but but our role really expanded in the state when um, we became integrally involved in the implementation of New York's Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. So I co-chair New York's Climate Action Council with DEC Commissioner Sagos, and, and one of our jobs is very much so to chart the course to achieve those ambitious goals in, in the Climate Act. So it, it places us both as a deployment and a a planning agency as well. Oh, that's really interesting. I didn't realize that it kind of had that uh, double aspect to it, and that's really great to know. So, yeah, you guys are dealing with a lot of environmental issues here in New York, and uh, the State of the State Address, Kathy Hochul just did, um, a lot of interesting things came out of that. And I think one of the most interesting things that I noticed, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the Cap and Invest program I noticed was quite impressive, everything that they had. I was just reading up on it a little bit, but can you tell me about a few of the things uh, from that State of the State address? And if you can elaborate more on Cap and Invest, that would be really appreciated. Well, certainly. Uh, so, so this Climate Action Council process has actually been ongoing for a, a number of years. And actually, at the end of 2022, the council voted um, to advance a scoping plan um, that has the product not only of years of work of the council, but also 11 public hearings, 35,000 public comments, and ultimately a document that lays out just answers really to this question of how. How do we achieve the goals of our climate law and what actions are we going to be taking across all sectors of our economy to achieve its objectives? And so really when we think about um, the governor's state of the state address, many of the actions contained within it um, are actually recommendations that are contained within that scoping plan. One of them relates to what we call economy-wide strategies, i.e., how do we actually enforce the caps um, within and the emission reductions within the scoping plan and the climate law? But then notably, how do we invest in ways to achieve the outcomes that we seek? 
And so the council spent a good amount of time thinking about these issues. And ultimately, this program that the governor has now advanced as a policy proposal in her state of the state was seen as the best way to go about not only achieving the 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and 85% reduction by 2050 that are part of the climate law, through enforceable caps administered by the Department of Environmental Conservation, but then how to actually advance um, investments um, through NYSERDA and others to achieve its outcomes. No, that's really impressive, all of that. Now, so you're talking a lot about caps in order to try to reach that reach that goal in 2030. I'm sure the caps are different for various businesses in different sectors and everything. But can you give us kind of like a general idea on what those caps are and what those businesses have to do? Sure. So so a cap and invest program, that's one really great thing that was emer- that emerged through the council process is that Cap and invest programs are actually used in in a number of different states now, and including um, the western states of of Washington, Oregon, and in California, as well as some in Canada. And really, the goal of these programs is to have some nuance to your question: um, how how do we cap emissions? Well, there's certain er- sectors of our economy that are frankly just very difficult to measure. Um, agriculture is a great example. Um, but there are also aspects of our economy that we really want to ensure that we advance in a way that builds industry and builds jobs and businesses across our state. So a cap and invest program can be built in ways to um continue to spur that activity by limiting costs to consumers who advance, as I said, various um, applications for businesses and industry across our state, while ensuring that we are truly addressing the major sources of emissions, notably fuel and fuel suppliers at the same time. So a cap and invest program really allows us to have a nuanced view to ways in which we can cap greenhouse gas emissions, but also to invest the proceeds and limit costs to New Yorkers. Fascinating. So you were saying a lot with the um, emissions and fuel aspect of it all is the, uh, especially for the Hudson Valley region in particular, since that's what we are, town square of the Hudson Valley. uh, What seems to be the biggest contributor to that? Are we talking about commuting and cars or are we talking about manufacturing and factories or is there another element in play that we, uh, the general person may not be thinking about? Yeah, it's been a very interesting part of our process has been to really look at the sources of greenhouse gas emissions across our state. And in fact, the largest source of emissions um, in our state is actually buildings. So the ways in which we heat and cool our homes and our businesses and the buildings that we're all in um, contribute uh, over 30 percent to New York's greenhouse gas emissions. Transportation is actually close behind. um, So certainly the ways in which we commute from place to place um, is right right close as well. And ultimately it does differ though to your to your question, the Hudson Valley is not the same as New York City, is not the same as Western New York, et cetera, such that if one were to sort of zoom in on the Hudson Valley, I would suspect transportation would be a larger contributor than it than it might be for New York City, as an example, where people are more likely to take public transportation or walk from place to place. Um, but all that to say, um, the Hudson Valley is, as many aspects of our state, it creates a similar issues, but nuanced ways in which to address those issues um, specific to this region. No, I'm sure. Um, that's fascinating to hear that buildings in particular, and not just like big time manufacturing buildings where you see like the big smokestacks, but just regular buildings like the ones that you and I are in right now are up there as the main contributor. That's something that would have never have crossed my mind without having this conversation. Uh, I find that really fascinating. And I think that's a really great uh, topic to bring up in particular. We're in the winter season. Um, It's snowing, it's cold currently, and everybody's trying to heat their homes and people are trying to be uh, smart and economic about how they do so. What are some really smart ways that 
both residents and businesses uh, can take to conserve energy and reduce their carbon footprint in this winter season? Well, it is true that in the very near term, we are very focused on what are rising energy costs um, across our state. Um, and and uh, in, to the point that you just asked about, in large part, that is due to the fluctuations of, of natural gas specifically and the costs that are associated with, with very um, I would say inconsistent uh, costs that that end up causing what we call volatility in our prices that we pay as consumers. So that's one reason why when we think about the solutions that we'll bring to bear, clean energy really becomes a major part of the solution set. Uh, resources like renewable resources like solar power or um, ways in which um, we can make our homes more efficient allow us not only to reduce our energy costs, but also to make them more stable over time. So when we think about um, ways in which uh, specifically the Hudson Valley can, can prioritize these types of investments, I would say that access to renewables like solar energy is would be a, a great start. Um, we have a program in New York called New York Sun that is really looking at how to really scale up smaller scale solar projects. Um, and in the Hudson Valley, uh, have the benefit of, uh, of first of all, some space for solar projects, but also, mm -hmm. frankly, the sun, one of the sunnier parts of our state, um, for sure. Yeah. Uh, but we have programs that that allow people not just to install solar in the ways you might think about, like on your roof or in your yard, but also um, community solar programs that allow access for solar for homeowners or businesses that may not be able to put a solar project right on their property. So I see a lot of interest in community solar in the Hudson Valley and, and solar resources in general. But it is also the case, um, you know, you mentioned winter and these costs that we're dealing with it is true that you can also uh, conserve energy, and that's a major way to create savings. So you can weatherize your home or your business to seal and insulate the property. And you can also take um, advantage of a number of programs that NYSERDA offers um, for income eligible households to look at um, audits and grants in ways that you can not only determine where you can improve your residence, but also how uh, a good bit of the costs of improvements can be covered. In Touch is nothing without the support from the hundreds of listeners we get on a weekly basis. Thank you so much for listening and taking part in the conversation. If you listen to In Touch through a podcast service such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please consider leaving a positive review. With more five-star reviews on these platforms, the algorithms will work harder to promote our show and bring in touch to new people. That and also sharing in touch with your friends and family is so important. Just sharing our links and listening live each Sunday goes such a long way. Thank you for all you do to stay in touch with what's going on in the Hudson Valley. You're currently listening to In Touch, Town Square Media, the Hudson Valley's Public Affairs and Issues Program. We have been speaking with Doreen Harris, President and CEO with NYSERDA. A lot of what we've been talking about already has been Governor, uh, Governor Kathy Hochul's State of the State Address and a number of the things addressing in that, environmentally speaking. We've also been talking about uh, the winter months and seasons and ways that Hudson Valley residents can really, you know, uh, hone in on conserving and just limiting their carbon footprint. Uh, there are a couple of things that you just brought up specifically about um, looking into some grants along with uh, the community solar. When you're talking about solar in particular, uh, you read my mind when I was like, what's the best way is like, what if you can't put it on your mm -hmm. house directly? And you talked about the uh, solar communities. And I just want to take a stab at that for a second what would have to go down in order to create one of these solar communities what's something that a town a village or something like that can expect for that kind of expansion well there's a lot of ways in which solar can be advanced in a community um, certainly as i said residents can install solar on their properties directly um, but i would say when we think about it, 
uh, building a system that is larger than what you would install at your residence um, or home, that's where we start to talk about larger scale solar projects. So the next sort of class up of solar projects would be community solar projects. And the neat thing about community solar projects is it literally aggregates um, home, homeowners, renters, or businesses together to um, come together to advance a solar project which may be sited elsewhere. And a community can do that, a municipality can do that, a group of, of members can do that as I described. But ultimately the energy itself you would receive your energy directly uh, via your utility bill like you always do, but mm -hmm. um, the solar project is actually offsetting a portion of that and providing credits to you on your electric bills for a portion, um, for the portion of the system's output. So that's kind of the, the next level up in an area where we see a lot of interest um, in the Hudson Valley and beyond. And then sort of the next step up would be a project that we would call a utility scale solar project. So that's where you would see in some cases dozens or hundreds of acres of land um, siting solar projects um, that are actually delivering to the grid and and serving oh, wow. what we would call the wholesale grid at the same time. So, so it sort of depends on uh, your application, but certainly a huge opportunity space with New York really actually leading um, specifically in the community solar market um we oh, have really? yeah we're the we're leading the way um number one for installations um last year and um certainly expect that pipeline to continue to grow that's terrific no happy to hear about that that's great and uh another thing that you brought up a moment ago was the uh, grants and audits and I'm just curious about that. What are ways, uh, is it accessible to specifically homeowners, to um, businesses, mix of both? How does one look into that and what could somebody expect? Yes, yeah, certainly. So this is back into the building space. Um, so we can do a lot to clean up our electricity supply, as we just described with solar as an example. But what does one do in their, in their home or in their business? So I had mentioned... Um, Efficiency upgrades, weatherization, and the like. We have a couple of programs at NYSERDA that are available for income eligible households to take advantage of energy efficiency services, lighting upgrades, appliance replacements, insulation, and specifically heating system upgrades as well. So one is um, known as Empower New York, which offers no cost improvement services to low income households. And the governor has actually proposed to expand that program to a new Empower Plus program, uh, adding $200 million to um, projects that actually use a uh, change uh, their heating sources to electricity. Wow. I'll talk about that in just a second. And then we have assisted home performance, which offers grants for up to 50% of the cost of improvements for moderate income households as well. And so a lot of what we're talking about in buildings is first making those buildings more efficient through weatherization and other investments. Then the second thing we're talking about, and also included in the governor's state of the state, is a change to using from using oil or propane or natural gas for heating um, to using electricity. Um, and to do that, you actually would use a technology known as a heat pump. And heat pumps are come in various different forms. Uh, Air source and ground source heat pumps are the technology that most people have heard of before, but they are technologies that can be used to both heat and cool buildings using electricity from the grid. And so we have a program in New York called New York State Clean Heat um, that is run through the local utilities, but is designed to provide rebates um, for the consumers who install heat pumps in their homes and businesses as well. Wow, that's terrific. And where's the best place that people can look into this and find this? Would it be just right on the NYSERDA website? It would. Um, we also have a website for the Climate Action Council. So climate, so NYSERDA.ny.gov is a great place to start. And then climate.ny.gov actually lays out uh, some of these developments that we talked about with respect to New York's climate goals, the scoping plan, and ultimately resources for New Yorkers to access all of these services as well. 
That's terrific. And for anybody listening, we will have access to that in the description of today's episode. In the last month alone, we've had some incredible guests here on In Touch. We started January off by talking to members of The Road to Recovery, an organization in affiliation with the American Cancer Society that provides rides to patients when needed all around the Hudson Valley. Then we had the executive director of Our Children on the show to discuss their efforts to helping incarcerated women and their families get back on their feet after difficult times. The Marist College Center for Lifetime Study taught us that regardless of age, there's always so much more to learn. They offer non-credit courses to Hudson Valley residents 55 years old and up to continue their education and offer a sense of community. Last week, we had local basketball officials discuss the Officials vs. Cancer basketball tournament, and it has become a major event in the high school basketball community in the last decade. Again, that's just from this month alone. We're so grateful to our guests, and we hope that you take a chance to check them out. If you have an important issue or story that needs to get out to the community, don't hesitate to reach out to connor.walsh at townsquaremedia.com. Again, you're listening to In Touch, Town Square Media, the Hudson Valley's public affairs and issues program. We've been having a great conversation with President and CEO of NYSERDA, Doreen Harris. Really appreciate the time that you've been given and just your overall insight on everything that's going on uh, concerning the state of the state and uh, the environmental aspects that are going on here in New York. Uh, as we wrap this up, is there any last second things that Hudson Valley residents should be aware of, any upcoming events or initiatives, or just things just things that they can do on their own to be the best uh, resident and neighbor that they can to the, both themselves and to their community? Well, when I think of the Hudson Valley, I really do think about the fact that there are not only an amazing group of citizens, but also really forward-thinking and forward-looking projects and initiatives that are unfolding in the Hudson Valley. Um, We've talked about the fact that the Hudson Valley is really focused on protecting our environment, um, working to counter the impacts of climate change, and to do something about it. So we have this gem in in New York known as the Hudson Valley in which people are not only interested in, as I said, acting, um, but advancing actions at scale to address this climate crisis. So, so we're at this moment in which um, there's the ability for people to act both in their homes and their businesses and their communities and really to set an example. New York is leading the way and I would say the Hudson Valley is is really central to those objectives. So um, it's a great opportunity to expand the leadership of the Hudson Valley as we look forward. Terrific. Doreen, thank you so much for your time and your insight. I know I really appreciate it. I'm sure everyone else does. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. You as well. This has been this week's edition of In Touch, the public affairs and issues program that runs across Town Square Media, the Hudson Valley radio stations. We want to give a big thank you to Doreen Harris. For more information on NYSERDA, visit nyserda.ny.gov. Of course, all links and information can be found in the description of this episode. Thank you to everyone who listened to In Touch in 2022 and now into 2023. Last year saw a lot of growth for the program, and we expect even more this year. You can find In Touch episodes, new and old, on your favorite streaming services like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and more. That and listen on demand with your Town Square radio station mobile app. Of course, you can still find all articles and audio under the In Touch tab on this radio station's app and website. Don't forget, we're also on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram at in touch underscore hv we're booking guest spots for 2023 we have a whole year ahead of us and we're excited whether you have a topic you want discussed or you want to be a guest the best way to contact us is through our office number 845-471-1500 or email direct to connor.walsh at townsquaremedia.com and remember that's connor with one n i've been your host connor walsh Until next time, stay curious, keep an open mind, and as always, I'm glad we get to spend some time.